Section 8.6, the ratio and root tests. Let's start with the definition. The infinite series of a sub n terms is called absolutely convergent if the series of the absolute values of those a sub n's is convergent. Definition, the series or summation a sub n is called conditionally convergent If the series A sub n converges, but the series of the absolute values of the A sub, n's, A sub n's does not, or let's say the series of the A sub n absolute values diverges. So just as a couple of quick examples. If I consider the series n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n over n squared, where of course we're saying a sub n is negative 1 to the n over n squared, then of course the absolute value of that a sub n would just be 1 over n squared, which means in this example the summation of the absolute values of these general a sub n terms would just be the infinite sum n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n squared which we know converges. Therefore we would say the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity negative 1 to the n over n squared converges absolutely and again, that just means that the series of the absolute values of these general terms, that series converges. So just notice we are talking about a different series. We're talking about an infinite series in which we take the absolute values of the general terms and then we form a new series. If that series of absolute values converges, then we're calling this original series an absolutely convergent series. Okay, what about the conditionally convergent? Uh, consider the example of n equals 1 to infinity negative 1 to the n over n. So similar type example except now the denominator is an n instead of an n squared. Okay, we know that if we took the infinite series of the absolute values of those terms that we would just get the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n which we know is the divergent harmonic series. Alright now does this series which would be in this case negative 1 plus 1 half minus 1 third plus 1 fourth and so on does that series converge? And the question, uh, or the answer at this point is we don't really know because we haven't addressed this sort of series with alternating terms, that is terms that alternate in sign. The answer is, as we'll see in the next section, this series does converge. So in this case, the actual series that we started with, negative 1 to the n over n, converges. but the series of the absolute values of those terms diverges. Okay, therefore we would say with our new definition that the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity negative 1 to the n over n converges conditionally. So this is the difference between these two definitions. We're taking an infinite series we're creating a new infinite series of the absolute values of the terms of the original series. If that series of absolute values forms a convergent series, 
we're calling the original series absolutely convergent. If that series of absolute values forms a divergent series, but the original series converges, then we're saying it converges conditionally. Okay, now we come to a pretty big theorem, which says the following. If a series, n equals 1 to infinity a sub n, is absolutely convergent, then number 1, that series is actually convergent itself and number two the absolute value of that infinite series that is the absolute value of the sum of that series is less than or equal to the infinite series in which the terms are the absolute values of the term of the original series um, before we go any further, notice that this should be plausible to you. If these were finite sums, and I had something like a sub 1 up through, let's say, a sub n, a finite sum, and I asked you, is it true that the absolute value of that sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of those original terms? And the answer would be yes, because that's just an application of the triangle inequality. All right, so in some, in a manner of speaking, then, uh, this inequality right here is something like a triangle inequality for infinite series. Okay, but the, the proof isn't as simple as just quoting the triangle inequality, because these aren't finite sums, they're infinite sums, which means we know there are limits involved. Okay, but to recap, what this theorem says is if you know a series is absolutely convergent, and remember what that means, this simply means that the series of the absolute values converges. And so this theorem says if the series of absolute values converges, then the series where the terms don't have absolute values on them also converges. And in fact, the absolute value of the original series is less than or equal to that absolutely convergent version where I've got absolute values on each of the terms. Okay, let's look at the proof of this theorem. Let's start by considering three sums. Let's consider the sum n equals 1 to infinity a sub n, which is the original series. The series n equals 1 to infinity absolute value of a sub n, where we're taking absolute values on every term. And then a third series, which is n equals 1 to infinity a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n, which basically looks like what? It looks like the term-by-term term sum of those two series. Okay, so let's take those three series and let's create three partial sum sequences. Let the sequences S sub n, let's say T sub n, and let's say R sub n. be the sequences of partial sums for these three series. So of course what we mean there is we'll let S sub n be the sequence of partial sums for that first series, T sub n be the sequence of partial sums for that one, R sub n be the sequence of partial sums for that third one. Okay, let's start out with a simple observation. Note, we can definitely say that a sub n plus the absolute value of a sub n is greater than or equal to zero, 
and less than or equal to 2 times the absolute value of a sub n. We know that because we know if a sub n is positive, then when I sum these two, I will just get two of these. If a sub n is negative, then when I add it to the absolute value of a sub n, I'll be adding the opposite of that, which means these two would make zero. Okay, so that means when I add these two, if a sub n is positive, then what I get is two times absolute value of a sub n. If a sub n is negative, then what I get when I add a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n is zero. So this is an either or. This thing in the middle is either equal to zero or it's equal to two times the absolute value of a sub n if a sub n is positive. Okay, we are assuming in this theorem, if we go back to the beginning, that a sub n is absolutely convergent. What does that mean? That means that the absolute value sum converges. Let's call that a sum of t. So if it converges, it has a sum. Let's say the sum is t. And again, that's because we assume that the series converges absolutely. And we know the definition of that, again, is just that this series of absolute values converges. Okay, notice that there's a little bit of, uh, or there can be a little bit of confusion uh, in the language here when you first learn this definition of absolutely convergent. We don't yet know that this series converges. When you say this series converges absolutely, what you're actually saying is that this series converges. Okay, what we're proving with this theorem is that if this series converges, so does the original series, the one that doesn't have absolute values. Now, notice that the sequence of partial sums Rn which again is the sequence of partial sums for this series. Well, what does r sub n look like? It looks like a sub 1 plus absolute value of a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus absolute value of a sub 2 plus dot 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 up through a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n. And what does tn look like? Of course, remember Tn is the sequence of partial sums for this one, which of course means Tn is just absolute value A1 plus absolute value A2 plus dot 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 absolute value of A sub n. And so it should be clear in looking at these two partial sums that the R sub n's themselves have to be greater than or equal to zero. Again, remember what we said, if one of these AKs, let's say this one, is negative, then when I add it to the positive version, I get zero. Okay, which means when I add up this finite sum, it can't be negative. Okay, what else do I know from looking at that sum? Well, we said if all of these AKs were positive, then adding to the absolute value of itself would make two of those positives, which means r sub n also has to be less than or equal to two of the tn's. Okay, remember, what is tn? It's just comprised of these positive terms. And we're saying the biggest that rn could be would be if every one of these terms, a sub 1, a sub 2, up through a sub n, were all positive, in which case we would get 2 times absolute value of a sub 1, 2 times absolute value of a sub 2, and so on. Okay, well now we have this inequality that says the partial sum for this series is less than or equal to 2 times the partial sum for that series. And of course, when I take limits, I know that the limit 
as n goes to infinity of 2 times the sequence of partial sums for the second series is just going to be 2t. So this says what? 0 is less than or equal to r sub n is less than or equal to 2t. Okay, I'll leave this for you to verify. Uh, one part is very obvious. This definitely says the sequence of partial sums Rn is bounded. It's bounded above by 2t. Okay, also, R sub n is a positive sequence. Uh, let me back up and s correct myself a little bit there. It's not quite what I meant to say. What I meant to say was each of these terms in Rn is greater than or equal to zero. This cannot be negative. This cannot be negative, and so forth. That means when I add up this finitely many terms in R sub n, I will get a non-negative sum. Okay, that means as n increases, this r sub n gets larger. What that says is that r sub n sequence is increasing. Okay, what happens when a sequence is bounded above and it's increasing? Then that implies that it converges. So the r n sequence converges. Okay, since that converges, and since Rn is, just to remind us, the sequence of partial sums for that series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n, then we know that series converges. Let's say n equals 1 to infinity a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n equals, let's call it r, since little r is the letter we use for the sequence of partial sums. So let's summarize what we have so far. We have that the series n equals 1 to infinity absolute value of a sub n converges. We assumed it did, and we called that equal to t. We said it converged to t. From that, we have also now proven that this series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n also converges. All right, now that implies something very simple. If we take the second series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n plus absolute value of a sub n, and perhaps just to emphasize this, I should be putting parentheses around that. If I take that series and I subtract the series n equals 1 to infinity absolute value of a sub n, well, we had a theorem some time ago that said what? If I have a series that converges and another series that converges and I add or subtract those two convergent series, then that sum or difference will also be a convergent series. Okay, what do I get when I subtract these two? I get n equals 1 to infinity a sub n. And since these two both converge, this sum also must converge. Therefore, the series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n converges, let's say it converges to s, i.e., the limit of the sequence of partial sums for that original an series exists and is equal to s. All right, now that proves the big part in the theorem, the first part, which is if this series converges, so does the basic series without absolute values. Okay, and again, just to repeat this, notice this other direction was never an implication. When a series converges, the absolute value series need not converge. But this theorem says the reverse is always true. If the absolute value series converges, then the series without absolute value 
will definitely converge. Okay, now let's notice if we put all this together, this simply says that S equals R minus T. And that's basically what we have on this line. Here is S, here's R, here's T, so S equals R minus T. Notice also that R is less than or equal to 2t. Hence, we know s is less than or equal to t. Note further that the infinite sum n equals 1 to infinity negative a sub n is just the negative of the series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n which is negative s. We know that we can factor a constant multiple outside the series, and since we know this converges to s, we know this converges to negative s. All right, now, what do those last two lines say? Well, they say that s is less than or equal to t, and negative s is less than or equal to t. If both of those are true, that's the same thing as saying the absolute value of s is less than or equal to t. Okay, what is s again? s is the sum of our basic series. So the left side of that inequality is actually the absolute value of the infinite series of the a sub n's. That's less than or equal to t. What was t? t was the limit of the sequence of partial sums of the series of absolute values. Okay, that means we have just proven the second part of the theorem, which is if I take the absolute value of the original infinite series, it is less than or equal to the sum or the infinite series of the absolute values of the terms in that original series, which is that infinite series triangle inequality that we were trying to prove in the second part of the theorem. All right, so just to sum up the important takeaways here, number one, if we know the infinite series of the absolute values converges, then we automatically know that the series without the absolute values converges. And so what we're really saying is, if a series converges absolutely, which is what this part says, then this theorem says that the series itself converges. Which is what this part says. Number two is if that series actually converges, then when I take its absolute value, that will be no greater than the infinite series whose terms are the absolute values of the terms I started with, which should seem plausible to you. If I'm replacing these a sub n's by absolute values, I know that some of these a sub n's could be negatives. If they are, then when I put absolute values on them, it makes sense that this sum, if it exists, should be bigger, or at least as big as this one. All right, so that's a pretty big theorem, and it's, it's going to motivate a bunch of things coming in the next few sections. And that brings us to the two namesake tests for this section. So let's start with the ratio test, which is probably the... Well, it's not probably the more important. It's It really is the one you're going to use the most of these two tests. And so for the ratio test, we'll just say for a sub n's that are not 0, so we want a, a series here in which there are no 0 terms. And just remember, if there were 0 terms in the first part of the series, we could always discard that and just look at the tail. So really when I say let's consider a series in which none of the a sub n's are 0, 
what I really mean is we want a series in which no terms in the tail. That is, for sufficiently large n, I don't want this series to have any zero terms. So let's suppose we don't have any zero terms. 1. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n exists and that limit is less than 1, then the series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n converges absolutely. And again, just to remind us what that says, if it converges absolutely, that now means what? It means that this series converges, and so does this series. Convergent absolutely means this series converges, but our big theorem that we just proved shows that any time a series converges absolutely, it also converges itself. Number two, if the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of this ratio a sub n plus 1 to a sub n, and by the way, just to say that out loud in words, we're talking about the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of two successive terms, the succeeding term over the previous term, a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. If the limit of the absolute value of that ratio exists and is greater than 1, then our series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n diverges. Uh, notice when I say equals L or greater than 1, I should add um, if this limit equals infinity, same conclusion. So what I could really say here is if this limit is greater than 1, and we could say infinity counts as greater than 1. So for case number 2, if our limit exists and is bigger than 1, or our limit is infinity, then our conclusion is the series diverges. Case number 3, which of course is what if the limit as n goes to infinity, a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is equal to 1, we have no conclusion. Meaning the series a sub n could converge, but it also might diverge. So this is the inconclusive case. Proof of, let's look at the proof of 1, which is the important part. And then when you see why 1 is true, you'll automatically see why 2 is true. And after you see those two, you'll also understand why 3 is inconclusive. All right, so let's look at the proof of 1, which is a pretty neat little proof. OK, suppose that the limit as n goes to infinity of this ratio a sub n plus 1 over a sub n absolute value is equal to L which is some positive limit less than 1. Let r be any number between l and 1. So of course we're saying here's 1, here's 0, we're getting a positive limit of some kind, and let r be any number between l and 1. Let's let the distance between those two, that is this distance right here, let's call that epsilon. So in other words, we're saying let epsilon equal r minus l. Or, to put that another way, r equals l plus epsilon. Because the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n equals l, 
we know that if we're given any epsilon greater than zero, there is some n greater than zero such that if my little n is sufficiently large, let's say larger than that big N, then what? My function that I'm taking the limit of, which is absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n, take away my limit should be less than epsilon. Let's continue to the next page. So copying that over, I've got that the absolute value of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n minus L is less than epsilon for n greater than n. Or to put it another way, if n is bigger than big N, then we can definitely say that the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is less than L plus epsilon. And that's just basically writing out what this inequality says on the right side. Of course, uh, remember what the epsilon was. That was the R minus L. So that means really what we're saying is when N is greater than N, the absolute value of A sub N plus 1 over A sub N is less than R. And the important thing is, where was R? Uh, we said that L was some positive limit less than 1. We said that there was 1 in our picture. Where was R? It was some number that's definitely positive and definitely strictly less than 1. So let me just, for emphasis here, write that that R is less than 1. OK, now what does that say? If we just continue to play with this a little bit, that says that if n is bigger than n, then the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 is less than r times the absolute value of a sub n. So one thing could be said immediately from this. We're saying that this right side is true if n is greater than big N. So what is the first little n value for which this inequality is true? Well, it would be n equals n plus 1. OK, that means this statement should be true if little n is equal to n plus 1, meaning a sub big N plus 2, absolute value, is less than r times absolute value of a sub big N plus 1. Okay, but of course this statement should also be true for any other small n values that are larger than that. So for example, it would also be true if n was equal to n plus 2. Let's write down what that one would be. If I let little n be n plus 2 in my inequality, what do I get? I get the absolute value of a sub n plus 3 is less than r times the absolute value of a sub n plus 2. Okay, but in this previous line, the one right above it, what did we say the absolute value of a sub n plus 2 is? It's less than r times the absolute value of n plus 1. That means down here on this second line, this r times absolute value of n plus 2 is less than r times r times the absolute value of a sub big N plus 1. In other words, the absolute value of a sub n plus 3 is less than r squared times the absolute value of a sub n plus 1. Okay, now I'll let you extrapolate here, but you should be able to see from the pattern I just built up in the last two lines that if I continue this process, I could say that the absolute value of a sub big, of n, big n plus 4 will be less than r cubed times a sub big n plus 1. And in general, I could say what? The absolute value of a sub, let's say, n plus k, 
should be less than r to the k minus 1 times a sub big N plus 1. Okay, there's the key inequality that we want to land on. And take a minute if you're watching this to make sure you see how I got from here to here and then how I generalize to make this statement. Okay, copying that to the next page, which I've done already. Okay, let's look at what this says. Um, what would happen if I formed a series on the right where the general terms looked like r to the k minus 1 times a sub big N plus 1? And let's say I ran that sum from k equals 1 to infinity. All right, let's just notice this is a constant, that a sub big N plus 1. That index is not a little n, it's a big N. So this is a particular term, which means that's a constant of some kind. So here I have a positive constant. Okay, what's this guy? Well, if I think about k equals 1 to infinity r to the k minus 1, that looks like a geometric series. And in fact, what have we required or built into that big R? Well, that it's actually absolute value less than 1. In fact, it's a positive number that we created so that it was less than 1. What do we know about geometric series when that common ratio has an absolute value less than 1? We know that that geometric series converges. And what else have we inserted in this series? Just a constant. That's a constant that could actually be pulled outside that series. In other words, when I make a series out of these terms, it's a convergent geometric series. Okay, since this is positive, and this side on the right is also positive, now we can appeal to something very simple, the direct comparison test. We know from our direct comparison test that if we have one expression in n less than or equal to another expression in n, and the larger expression forms a convergent infinite series, then these smaller positive terms also have to form a convergent series and that sum will be less than or equal to the sum of the larger bn terms. Okay, so applying the direct comparison test directly says that if the series built out of these things converges, then the series built out of these things converges. Therefore, I can say the series n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n plus k I can say that that series converges. Okay, by the way, what is this series? Well, it's the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 plus the absolute value of a sub n plus 2 and so forth. Notice that this is the tail of the series n equals 1 to infinity absolute value a sub n. I've just deleted the first big N terms. Remember that the only thing that really affects convergence is the tail. And what we've built here is a series whose tail converges, which means this entire series converges, that is, this series. Okay, what do we know if the series of absolute values converges? We know that the series itself also converges. And that proves the first case of the ratio test, which is if the limit of the absolute value of those ratios of a sub n plus 1 to a sub n equals a limit, a positive limit less than 1, then two things are true. The series converges absolutely and it converges. Okay, now, for the same reason, um, if this ratio, this r number, is not less than 1, then what we get is a geometric series where the common ratio is larger than 1. And in that case, we know the series converges, or diverges, rather. In the case when that ratio is 1, it is possible to actually get series that converge even when that ratio is 1. Um, I'll let you think about how that could happen or, or why that would happen. 
but suffice it to say because of those exceptions when the limit of that ratio is one uh, the answer is inconclusive all right now I'll do a couple of examples in a minute uh, but let's state the other test which is the root test which is very similar sounding uh, similar in that there are three cases again for a series consisting of non-zero terms we have three cases if the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n is a positive limit less than one that will imply that that series converges absolutely case 2 and you can guess what's coming here if the limit of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n is equal to a positive limit that's bigger than 1 um, and I should say or infinity then that implies that the series of a sub n's diverges case 3 just what you're expecting if the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n equals 1 itself no conclusion okay so of course the, the names make sense now in the ratio test I'm looking at the limit of ratios of terms and for the root test I'm looking for the limit of the nth root of the nth term all right, let's look at some examples now. And of course, uh, when it comes to actually applying these tests, they're pretty easy to apply. And it's usually pretty easy to decide which one of these two you want to use if your choice is to use ratio test or root test. Actually, let's go to another page. Okay, so let's look at the example of n equals 1 to infinity. Um, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n over 2 to the n. Okay, now what, what can I tell about this before I even start thinking about any of these tests from this section? Well, the first thing I would probably try and do, now that you're starting to accumulate this list of tests, if this was just a random question on a test, the first thing I would try is the nth term test uh, just to see if this limit of this general term is zero or not. And of course, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n times n over 2 to the n, uh, I know simply that this, and by the way, that should be n plus 1, I know simply that this part will make the terms alternate in sign and if I look at the ratio of n to 2 to the n, I know 2 to the n dominates, which means over the long haul, I know this limit will be 0. Okay, what does that conclude? Or what can you conclude from that? And the answer is nothing. The nth term test says what? If the limit of this general term is not 0, then the series diverges. Okay, if the limit is 0, that just means that... Uh, one of the conditions for convergence has been met but it doesn't necessarily mean it converges all right now here is where the the real advantage of the methods from this section comes in if you think about all the other previous methods we had like the limit comparison test the direct comparison test they were really predicated on series that had positive terms okay now we've crossed over into terms that have negative and positive terms. In fact, this is a term or a, a series that alternates in sign. That means your direct comparison and limit comparison test cannot apply to this one. Okay, but your ratio and root test do because they have absolute values because they're checking for absolute convergence. All right, now when I look at this, if the question is which one should I use, should I use ratio or root, uh, I'm going to say that 9 times out of 10, the one you probably want is the ratio test. I will say that if you're looking at uh, this part right here, that one would lend itself to a root test, 
because if I took 2 to the n and raised it to the 1 nth power, which would be the nth root, uh, that would be great. That would just be 2. But I'd also have to do it in the top, which means I'd have to have an n to the 1 nth. Now, we can do that limit. In fact, we know that limit is 1, which means the limit of this part is 1 half. So actually, if I did use the root test, what I should get when I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of this expression, which would be n over 2 to the n, would definitely be limit n goes to infinity n to the 1 nth over 2, which is 1 half, which is a positive limit less than 1, which means this series converges absolutely. Okay, notice what that says. It says that this series converges absolutely, which means the series itself also converges. That means when I put the alternation back in, the series still converges. All right, now, I, I kind of uh, started this problem by selling this as one where I might want to try the ratio test, but I went ahead and did the root test. Let's look at what the ratio test would look like. Okay, just to run through this, the ratio test says what? It says that you take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. Okay, what's that going to look like? Well, a sub n is just this guy with all of those n's changed to n plus 1's, which means negative 1 to the n plus 2 times n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. All right, what are you going to do with that? You're going to divide by a sub n, which means you're going to divide by negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n over 2 to the n. Okay, now, once I get past this first example, I won't write it this way anymore uh, because you can see the simpler way to write that would just be to write limit as n goes to infinity absolute value negative 1 to the n plus 2 times n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 and rather than write a big complex fraction with a fraction on the top and a fraction at the bottom it would make much more sense to just multiply by the reciprocal of this guy and that's how I'll write it from now on. And so there's the limit I'm looking at when I do the ratio test on this one. Now, what's one of the things that makes the ratio test nice? Well, if you have any of these negative 1 to the n or n plus 1 or n plus 2 factors floating around inside this absolute value, we know that all of these will turn into ones, which means I really can ignore those. What I'm really looking at here is just the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 times 2 to the n over, uh, let's say, n times 2 to the n plus 1. And notice I've dropped the absolute values because I know all of those factors are positive. Okay, very simply, this is the point where you try to simplify. And obviously, right here, there is a really big simplification. There's really just a one-half left out of that. And what I'm left with is limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 over n. I know that limit is 1, which means my answer here for the whole ratio test is one-half. It's the same limit I got up here when I was talking about how to do the root test on this series. In both cases, if you get a positive limit that's less than 1, it implies absolute convergence. Okay, so that's sort of a quick rundown on what both tests look like. And they're not going to look much different than that in any of these problems you do. Um, I will say there are some problems where one method or the other is more appropriate. Um, let's see here. Let's try another one.
Okay, let's try this one. Infinite series, n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n over n factorial. All right, now, um, one thing I might be thinking about right away is when I look at the ratio of those two, I know that n factorial dominates. And of course, I remember my little special rule that says when n goes to infinity, if I take any real number to the nth over n factorial, that that limit's always zero. Okay, remember, that's great. That is a precondition for convergence, but it's not sufficient to guarantee convergence. So on its own, that doesn't really tell me whether this thing converges or not. It just says that it could. All right, now I will point out there is an obvious choice here if you're going to use ratio test or root test, which one to use. Uh, notice that at some point if I use the root test, then when I get to that denominator, I would have to take the nth root of an n factorial. And that is not a good combination. If you try to play with that algebraically, it's a mess and you don't really get anywhere. So I guess my suggestion would be when you see general terms that contain factorials, uh, the ratio test is probably the test you want to use. And you'll see why here when I go ahead and do it in this example. So let's do the ratio test for this one. And then later on, if you want to try the, the root test just to see what it's like. Okay, so I'm going to be a little quicker this time. I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. And notice that what it would actually look like if I wrote it out would be absolute value of negative 1 to the n plus 2 times 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by this, which really means times the reciprocal of that, which would be n factorial over negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n. Okay, and this is one of the, the nice things about the ratio test. For many, many series, when you take this ratio of the a n plus 1 over a n, there's going to be a lot of commonality between those two, which means there's usually a lot of reduction that happens. In this case, I know I can discard those negatives immediately. And if I look at these two, I realize that's just going to be a 2. So it means I've got limit and goes to infinity with a 2 in the top. And then what's the other thing that's left there? It's this n factorial and this n plus 1 factorial. Okay, now we haven't dealt much with simplifying factorials yet, but we're going to be doing that fairly routinely here in the next few sections. So just notice when I take something like n factorial over n plus 1 factorial, if you're not used to factorials and don't know how to do this quickly, that's okay. Uh, the first few times you could just write out what these are. What is n factorial? It's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and it's the product of all of the other positive integers that come before n. Okay, what's n plus 1 factorial? Well, it's n plus 1 times all of the integers that come before it, all the positive integers. So that means the integer before n plus 1, which is n times the 1 before n times the 1 before n minus 1, down to 1. And as you look at those two, you should spot that n factorial is contained in n plus 1 factorial. In fact, what's the only thing that's left? It's really just that n plus 1 on the bottom. Okay, I don't really need absolute values. That's just limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over n plus 1. And I shouldn't have been saying that the limit needs to be positive. And I, don't, I didn't say that in the, the theorem. This limit can definitely be 0. The limit just needs to be less than 1. It doesn't need to be positive. So let, let me reiterate, reiterate, reiterate that and make sure you understand that. In both of these tests, the ratio test and the root test,
if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value and that limit is less than 1. Okay, and the theorem, I, th I think I may have said before that that was a positive number. It doesn't actually have to be positive, this limit. That limit could be 0. In this case, the limit is less than 1. It's finite. Finite is the important part, and the limit is less than 1. Therefore, this series converges, and it converges absolutely. All right, let's try another example. Let's look at the series n equals 1 to infinity. How about negative 1 to the n, 3 to the 2n plus 1 over n to the 2n. All right, now, the dead giveaway here should be these powers that I see. I see the 2n power down here in the bottom. I see the 2n plus 1 power up there. Uh, when I see those kind of powers and I think about what the root test does, that is where I'm taking the nth root of the general term, I know that means, of course, that I'm raising the general term to the 1 over n power. And so when I see lots of powers in various parts of my an that contain n, that's a clue that the ratio, or rather the root test, might be a good test for this. All right, so in this case, let's try the root test. And if I did that, I would have limit n goes to infinity. Now, of course, it's the nth root of the absolute value of this, which means when I take the absolute value, this part's going to get killed out which means what I'm going to be left with is the nth root of 3 to the 2n plus 1 over n to the 2n. Um, if we actually look at that for a second, that is the 3 to the 2n plus 1 over n to the 2n. Of course, I know the top is just 3 times 3 to the 2n over n to the 2n. And if I look a little bit closer, I know that 3 is just a constant that gets pulled out. And then what's left is 3 to the 2n over n to the 2n. And really, if I look a little closer, I understand that that's just 3 times 9 to the n over n squared to the n. In other words, it's really just 3 times 9 over n squared to the n. And that's really what I'm taking the limit of up here. Limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of 3 times 9 over n squared to the nth power. And I'm taking the nth root. Okay, so what does that give me? It gives me limit as n goes to infinity of 3 to the 1 nth times 9 over n squared. Obviously here when I raise this 9 over n squared to the n <clears throat> to the 1 nth, I get my exponents to cancel out and I'm just left with that 9 over n squared. In other words, I'm just taking the limit as n goes to infinity of 9 times 3 to the 1 over n over n squared. Okay, what is that limit? Let's see, when n goes to infinity, this part goes to 0, which means this whole thing is approaching 3 to the 0, which is 1. What is the limit as n goes to infinity of 9 over n squared? That would be 0, which means if I think of this as limit n goes to infinity of 9 over n squared times 3 to the 1 over n, what we're saying is this part goes to 0 and this part goes to 1, which means the limit is 0. Remember, that limit, as long as it is less than 1, then my root test says my original series converges absolutely.
Okay, let's look at one more. So we have the series n equals 1 to infinity. Uh, my general term looks like 1 times 3 times 5 times 7 times dot 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 up through 2n minus 1. And notice that 2n minus 1 will always be an odd number over 1 times 4 times 7 times 10 times dot 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 up through 3n minus 2. Okay, of course, notice when, uh, just to get an idea of what this looks like, if n was 1, uh, then of course this guy right here would be 1, and this guy right here would also be 1, which means that would be my first partial sum, and it would just be 1. If n was 2, what would I have? Well, if n was 2, then this guy on the top would give me 3, which means I would have the 1 and the 3. And in the bottom, if n was 2 on this thing at the end, that would be 3 times 2 is 6 minus 2 is 4, and that would give me these two. So that means s sub 2 would be the term when n is 1 plus the term when n is 2, which would be the 1 times 3 over the 1 times 4. And so you can see in general here, I'm going to build up the nth term by adding sums or adding terms that look like these, where I just keep adding more and more factors in both the numerator and the denominator, where the pattern in those factors is what? Well, there are odd factors in the top, and the bottom, they're separated by 3. It's an arithmetic sequence. All right, so which method that we've talked about in this section would make more sense? Well, it should be fairly obvious that it's the, the ratio test. These aren't precisely factorials, but they are factorial in nature. They are a product of consecutive integers. Well, not consecutive integers, but a product of integers following some pattern. Uh, when we see series like this, the ratio test is really the test to try. And we can see that if we write out what the ratio test would look like for this one. So let's make sure we can write this out carefully. So again, just to remind us, if a sub n is 1 times 3 times 5 up to 2n minus 1 over 1 times 4 times 7 up to 3n minus 2, then for my ratio test, I just need to look at the limit of the ratio of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. Okay, so what does it look like when I do a sub n plus 1? It should be this guy where I'm swapping out those n's for n plus 1's, which means the numerator up here should look like 1 times 3 times 5 times 7 up through 2 times n plus 1 minus 1, which would be 2n plus 1, over 1 times 4 times 7 up through. OK, what's the last number that I want in that product? Well, it's not 3n minus 2 anymore. It's 3 times n plus 1 minus 2, which is 3n plus 3 minus 2 which is 3n plus 1. And that makes sense if you think about where 3n minus 2 is. What's the next integer? It's 3n minus 1. What's the next one? It's 3n. What's the next one? It's 3n plus 1. And what is the separation between the factors in this denominator? It's supposed to be 3 every time. And there's my 1, 2, 3 difference. So this last factor should be 3n plus 1. Divided by a sub n, which I know in this case really means multiply by the reciprocal of a sub n, which is 1 times 4 times 7 up through 3n minus 2 over 1 times 3 times 5 up through 2n minus 1. 
Okay, now, let's notice here, just so we get a clearer picture of this, which one of these two has more factors? And of course, it's the one when I used n plus 1. It's this one here. In fact, if I wrote out what those two look like, it should be clear that in the bottom, and I'm looking at this part now, in the bottom I have a 1 times a 3 times a 5 up through a 2n minus 1. It should be clear when I look at this part that that is precisely 1 times 3 times 5 all the way up to 2n minus 1. But what is the integer in that sequence that comes just before 2n plus 1? It's 2n minus 1. Remember, this product right here is just a product of consecutive odd numbers. If the last number in that product is 2n plus 1, the number before it would have to be the previous odd number, which would be 2 back. Okay, so what we're saying is this number, this number has this in it. In fact, what's the only thing that's left over? this part and this part cancel, which means I'm left with the 2n plus 1. Okay, the same thing should be true when I look at these two. The top is 1 times 4 times 7 up through 3n minus 2. The bottom is 1 times 4 times 7 up through 3n plus 1. But what's the number that's 3 behind 3n plus 1? It's 3n minus 2. Which means, of course, all of this cancels with all of this. And what I'm left with is 3n plus 1. All right, now, what does that leave me? It leaves me limit as n goes to infinity of what's left in the top, 2n plus 1, what's left in the bottom, 3n plus 1. What's that limit? It's 2 thirds, which is less than 1, which means this series converges absolutely. Now, notice here, it's not too hard to create a series that's divergent by just manipulating these things a little bit. And you should be able to easily see that if these were flipped upside down, then my limit down here would have been 3 halves which is greater than 1. And if that's the case, that series would diverge. Okay, in this case, convergent, convergent absolutely. And that shows you how to handle these factorial, well, they're not really factorial, but let's just say factorial in nature or appearance. Uh, definitely the ratio test is the way to go. Okay, good place to stop. Let me know if you have questions.